Hello, my name is David Ritchie and I serve as lead pastor of Redeemer Christian Church in Amarillo, Texas. We're excited that you're listening to this sermon today. Uh, we hope that you enjoy it. We hope it's a blessing to you. But we want you to know that this is in no way intended to be a replacement for your local church. In fact, we hope that you are a part of a local church, whether that's here at Redeemer Christian Church in Amarillo or a part of another local church. We want you to be a part of the body of Christ. Likewise, we want to let you know that the reason we're able to offer this freely to you is because of the generous donations that people have made to support the mission of Redeemer Christian Church. And so if you'd like to support us financially, we encourage you to go online at RedeemerChristianChurch.com and consider making a donation so that we can continue to be a church that declares the gospel of Jesus Christ and displays the gospel of Jesus Christ to our neighbors and to the nations. God bless you. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have revealed yourself to us through the gift of your Holy Scripture. Thank you truly for the gift of your word. And Lord, I admit today's passage of Scripture is a little bit hard to understand. We're centuries removed from the situations and the arguments that were going on at the time of Jesus Christ. But I thank you that your Holy Spirit that inspired these words to be written is living and active. And he speaks to us. And he is yet still revealing Jesus Christ, your son, to us. And so I do pray that you would give us eyes to behold Jesus Christ, your son, that we would worship him, that we would obey him, that we would be astonished at the reality of who he is and be transformed to be faithfully your people in this world. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. You can have your seat today. There are certain things you just never would want to do. You would never want to get into a fist fight with Mike Tyson. Bad idea, correct? You would never want to go head-to-head with an NFL linebacker and try to score a touchdown against that linebacker. It's not going to be a good day for you. You probably don't want to decide to heckle a comedian in public whenever that comedian is armed with a quick wit and a microphone in front of a crowd and an audience. That's not a good idea. And especially, you would never want to get into a theological argument with God himself. Correct? Yet that is exactly what has happened all throughout Luke chapter 20. We're in a portion of the Gospel of Luke where Jesus has arrived in the city of Jerusalem. And ever since he has been here, the religious leaders around him have been trying to argue with him. They've been trying to humiliate him. And there's tremendous irony at play uh, all surrounding this chapter. Most of these religious leaders would have said they have based their life on a longing for the kingdom of heaven to come to earth. They've been longing for the promised Messiah to appear. They've been longing for a God yet again to speak to his people. And now there is one who stands before them that is the very embodiment of the kingdom of heaven on earth. He is the Messiah, and he is God in flesh speaking with them. But the preconceptions of these religious leaders, the theological ideas that they have in their minds prevent them from seeing Jesus for who he really is. Their theology, which literally means the knowledge of God, prevents them from knowing God when he's right in front of them. And this does provoke a a very important question. Is Is it possible for our theological preconceptions to actually prevent us from truly knowing God. Now, I ask this as a pastor who happens to be very much pro-theology. I love theology. I've given thousands of hours of my life to studying theology. And just so we're clear on definitions, theology is something that we all have because a simple definition of theology is simply what we believe to be true about God. And so, I believe, actually, the American church needs more theology, not less. But when I say more theology, I want to be clear that I mean good theology. Because there is plenty of bad theology that is in the United States of America and in the American church. See, good theology leads us to, it ignites within us a greater devotion to God. But bad theology can actually lead us to being distracted from God. Good theology leads us to trusting faith, loving worship, heartfelt obedience to God. Whereas bad theology can puff us up with pride. And it fosters division within the body of Christ. We see 
in this passage of Scripture that Jesus refuses to be confined or bound by the preconceptions of man-made bad theology. He will not entertain these man-made theological speculations or he will not play our theological games. But more importantly, what I hope to show you in this passage of Scripture is that Jesus is so much better than any God we could ever imagine or conjure with our own man-made theology. That he is better than any bad theology could ever conceive. And so in pa- in pa- unpacking this passage of Scripture, we're going to look at two things. We're going to look at the Sadducees' question for Jesus, and then point number two, in return, we're going to look at Jesus' question for the Sadducees. So point number one, the Sadducees' question for Jesus. Now, during Jesus' lifetime, there are multiple religious factions among the Jewish people. They would have all considered themselves to be Jewish people. They would have considered themselves to be a part of God's people, but they differed in what they believed, and they differed in how they practiced their religion. And it's somewhat similar to what we see among different Christian denominations today. And up until this point in the Gospel of Luke, the religious faction that we have seen Jesus relate with and dialogue with and argue with are the Pharisees. Um, The Pharisees are the group of guys that we've seen him battle throughout the scriptures, but in this passage, a, a new set of challengers approach. They are the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees are a little bit different because they're made up of upper class people. They're typically aristocratic. They're typically very educated, and their version of the Jewish faith was considered to be a lot more sophisticated, intellectually respectable among the people in the world. As verse 27 of our passage states today, the Sadducees were known by the fact that they did not believe in the doctrine of the resurrection. They didn't believe that the resurrection from the dead was something that was going to happen. Now, according to old school Judaism, whenever that term, the resurrection, was used, it wasn't just talking about God's power and capacity to bring people from the dead to life. It was a shorthand nomenclature for a future hope. When one day God would bring his kingdom on earth, he would make all things new, he would judge all wickedness and evil, and all of his people would rise from the dead and they would enjoy his new creation. You see, the Sadducees at this point in history, didn't believe in any of this. They pretty much denied anything that seemed supernatural. And so they denied the reality of the human soul. They denied that there were angels that existed. They denied any vision of heaven or version of the afterlife. And that's why the Sadducees were so sad, you see. It's an old school theology joke. Up until this point in Luke, the scribes and Pharisees have been put to shame by the brilliant wisdom of Jesus Christ. And now the Sadducees have decided that they want a turn. And they have this theological question that they think is designed to stump everybody, including Jesus. And it should be noted that their question is not in any way a serious or practical question. This is not a question that is designed to help shepherd God's people or to help people that are in pain. It's purely speculative. It's a hypothetical scenario of what I like to call one bride for seven brothers. Let's look back at the parable that these guys tell. And they asked him a question saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children, and the second and the third took her, and likewise all seven left no children and died. Afterward, the woman also died in the resurrection. Therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had her as wife. Now this question is based off of a very odd, a very obscure Old Testament law. It was an Old Testament law that was to govern the nation of Israel during the Old Testament era. And it was a law that has been called by theologians since then the law of leveret marriage. Essentially, it was a law that was designed to protect widows. Now, in the ancient world, what you have to realize is that widows were among the most vulnerable people in society. And so if you were a married woman and all of a sudden your husband died, you didn't just lose your husband. You didn't just lose your spouse. You lost your way of income. You lost, um, in many cases, your shelter, your means of protection. 
And more than that, it was a very difficult thing to be able to find another husband because marriages were arranged in that culture in that day and age. And, And so essentially what the law of leveret marriage was designed to be able to do, it was designed to provide for vulnerable widows. If a deceased husband had a brother, it would be the responsibility, the role of that brother to marry his brother's widow and to be able to take care of her and to provide for her. And here's the big idea that I want you to see in this. The context and the intent of the Old Testament law that the Sadducees are talking about is about protecting vulnerable women. This is not a verse in the Bible in any way that is about the afterlife. It's not something that we're supposed to build a doctrine of the afterlife on. But the Sadducees are very much intentionally taking this verse out of context to argue for a theological hobby horse of sorts. They want to use this law as a way to disprove the reality of a future resurrection. And here's a little bit of advice I do want to give you whenever you get into theological discussions or theological arguments. There are no correct answers to inherently wrong questions. And that's exactly what has happened to Jesus. He has been asked essentially a ridiculous question. In fact, the Sadducees, I believe, know that their question is absurd. And it's really along the same lines of certain defeater arguments that you might pick up on online forums that are arguing about the reality of God. Can God, if he really exists, could he make a rock that is so big that even he couldn't lift it? And it's a ridiculous question, right? It's kind of like asking, can God microwave a burrito so hot that he couldn't eat it? It's just, it's absurd. It's not meant to be serious in any way. They know it's ridiculous, but Jesus' response is nevertheless brilliant. Essentially, what Jesus is going to say is, your way of thinking about these things is so bound within the terms of this age and this reality. And what I want you to see is that the age to come is so much better. It's so much more brilliant than you can even imagine that you don't have the mental categories to even conceive or understand it. In fact, whenever the Old Testament prophets speak of this reality of the age to come, of new creation, of eternity, they typically have to talk in metaphors that defy reality as we know it. Here's one example from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. He says of this age of new creation, that the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf with the lion and the fattened calf together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. For God's people, what you have to see is that the goodness of the age to come is beyond our capacity to describe or even to understand. So what then we might ask about this question of marriage? Because some people have taken this passage to say, well, Jesus has a very low view of marriage, and that just can't be said in context of the New Testament. In fact, we see in the New Testament that Christian marriage is one of the ways for Christians to be able to bear the image of Christ and his amazing love that he has for his people. In Christianity, Marriage is designed to be a covenantal union between one man and one woman. It's designed to create an intimacy that only comes from deep commitment and sacrificial love. And that covenant of marriage at its best is a way that people can experience being truly known and truly loved. But even marriage, according to this passage, at its very, very best, is still only a shadow of an even deeper of an even greater and more intimate union that is yet to come. An eternal union between God and his people. So, with that said, I believe that for those that are married, if you pass into eternity, heaven is still only gain. You don't lose anything. But that we do possess the, the concepts and the categories to just try to imagine something. What we have to believe and trust in faith by trusting the character of God is that eternity is so much greater than we could ever imagine. And finally, Jesus concludes his response by illustrating how the Old Testament itself 
implies that God is not a God of the dead. He is a God of the living. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Faith in God. In other words, he's saying to the Sadducees, it's not just a matter of cultural history. It's not just a matter of moral fables. Our faith is to be a living faith that entails all of our lives. And as a result of this theological exchange, even the scribes, the guys that were who were in the last portion of Scripture trying to attack Jesus, those guys are impressed with how Jesus quickly and definitively demolishes the arguments of the intellectually respectable Sadducees. Look at verses 39 and 40. Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well. For they no longer dared to ask him any more questions. Everybody is done trying to stump Jesus. Everybody has learned their lesson. But that's not where the story ends. Look at point number two, Jesus' question for the Sadducees. Jesus then turns the table on the Sadducees and on the religious leaders who have been questioning him. He asks them a question, essentially, that no one can solve. And what you have to understand about Jewish religious culture at this time is that it wasn't about having the right answer. It was about being able to ask the right questions. That in this society, a a great question truly was valued more so than a great answer. And so, Jesus asks the religious leaders of Jerusalem. I mean, this is the most important city. This is where the greatest minds of the Jewish faith are at this moment. He asks them a question about the promised Messiah that's coming. And he's going to ask them a question about the Messiah by quoting Psalm chapter 110. Let's look at the text. But he said to them, how can they say the Christ, that is the Messiah, is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David thus calls him Lord. How is he his son? Now, Psalm 110 was not only considered a song that the Jewish people sang in times of worship, It was already at this time considered to be a part of God's holy word. And it was also seen at this time as a prophecy about the Messiah who was promised to come and deliver God's people. Now that word Messiah, you've probably heard that if you've been at church any amount of time. In the Jewish language, it simply just means the anointed one. The Messiah was the anointed one who was going to be sent by God to deliver God's people. Because remember... The Jewish people at this time are under the subjugation of the Roman Empire. They are under the tyranny of a pagan empire. They are longing for, they are hoping for this Old Testament promise that God is going to send an anointed king, a Messiah, who would deliver them from this tyranny and be able to ignite God's kingdom on earth. Now there's tons of Old Testament references and clues about who this Messiah is going to be and what he is going to accomplish and what he is going to look like. But one thing was pretty much for certain. Everyone knew and believed that this Messiah had to be a descendant from the Old Testament King David. Everybody knew that he had to be a descendant of the true king. But Jesus points out something apparently no one had ever seen or observed in Psalm 110. This is a psalm believed to be written by King David. And so Jesus asks, how is it possible for David, the author of this psalm, to speaking about the Messiah and the Messiah is his descendant, why would David call his own descendant Lord? That makes no sense. Because again, in a Jewish culture, the father was always accorded with more honor than his son or his descendant. How then is it possible for David, the greatest king of Israel, the greatest king of the golden age of the kingdom. How is it possible for him to call his own descendant Lord? All of the scribes, all of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, are speechless. They do not know the answer to this question. And Jesus, probably frustrating for them, does not give the answer to them. And in the world of first century Judaism, if you ask a question that no one else can answer, that means you win. That you are the top dog, you are the best rabbi, you are the one who is now seen as the authority. Now I realize, what I have just given you is probably seen as an avalanche of historical content about the first century that was probably a little bit more than you bargained for on this Sunday morning. But I do think it's important sometimes for us to understand these things because we can't understand the Bible sometimes without 
digging in the way that we've just been able to do. But you might be asking, how does this all fit together? How does it apply to us? How does it mean something for us today? And I'll answer that first question first of how does this all fit together? Because I do believe that there is a relationship between the question that the Sadducees ask Jesus and the question that Jesus asks the Sadducees. Essentially, in responding to the question that the Sadducees ask Jesus, he is saying that eternity, the concept of new creation, the age that is to come, listen, my people, it is so much better and so much more beyond what you are capable of imagining. And in the same way, when he is addressing this question from Psalm chapter 110, he is saying in the same way that you do not have the categories to understand how good God's new creation in the age to come will be, nor do you have the capacity to understand who the Messiah God is going to send is going to be, that he is better than we could ever imagine. Because essentially there's only one real answer for how David, the king of Israel, could call his own descendant Lord. The answer is something that no Jewish leader at this time could have ever dreamed of. Because it can only be true if this descendant of David is truly a descendant of King David. He is truly, fully man. But that he is also truly, fully God and the Son of God. And whereas all the religious leaders don't recognize that the Messiah that is standing before them right now is one who truly is completely man and completely God, that he is standing right in front of them, speaking to them now. And even more, what they could not recognize is that in a few days, the city of Jerusalem is going to see some pretty strange things. Because in the week to come, Jesus Christ this very popular teacher in the temple, this, this national figure that is being famous for being a worker of miracles and a prophet of God, this Jesus will die on a cross. But three days later, he will rise again. And a few weeks after that, his followers will be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And an uneducated fisherman named Simon Peter is going to stand before these same people in the city of Jerusalem and he is going to solve the riddle of Psalm chapter 110. Luke himself records the sermon that he gives on that Pentecost Sunday and we're going to see how Simon Peter the fisherman solves the problem of Psalm chapter 110. He says, being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne He, David, foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured out on this. This you yourselves are seeing and hearing, for David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, And this is a quote of Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Why does this matter for us today? It shows us that God has a very long and established track record of defying the categories that we try to place around him. He has a long track record of shattering our preconceptions in the most surprising and in the most glorious ways. It shows us that whatever we might be able to imagine about God, that he is infinitely better. Because who could possibly imagine a triune God of one God in three persons? Who could possibly imagine a Messiah who is completely God and completely man? Who could imagine a Savior that would go to a Roman cross and die for the sake of his enemies even though he was perfectly righteous? Who could possibly imagine a God that would embrace the power of death and overcome it so that he could defeat the power of death itself? Who can imagine a creator God that though his creation rebelled against him, responded by unfolding a brilliant plan of redemption that will conclude with him making all things new? These 
theological truths that I've just described are not speculations. They are not hypothetical scenarios. They are what is revealed to be most true and most important in the Bible. Those are the theological truths that will move us to worship. Those are the theological truths that Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 are of first importance. They are the theological truths that have split human history into two pieces. They are the truths that will set you free, and they are the truths that will give your heart hope. So Redeemer Christian Church, may we be a people that stand before Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, with awestruck wonder and worship. May we be a people that embrace a true theology, a good theology that leads us to a deeper devotion and worship and love and faith. And may we rest in the truth that the God of this gospel is so much better than we could ever imagine. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, you're infinite, you're glorious, you are holy. How could we possibly ever come to know you? By simply using the power of our own imagination. No, we absolutely need your revealed word. We need your capacity to speak to us and to change our hearts. Lord, I do pray that you would expose in our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit maybe any theological idea or any biblical doctrine that we've been caught on, that we've been distracted by, that has been taking us away from a greater and more devoted worship to you. I pray that when we look into your word, that we would see you for who you are, that you would ignite in our hearts a vision of your holiness, of your glory, your splendor, and your infinite love for us. And I pray that in response, we would be a people who worship you, that we would worship you in our words, that we would worship you with our thoughts, that we would worship you with our lives. So Lord, we commit our hearts to you, and I pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to proclaim your truth deeply within us, that we would be a changed people, that we would know you and worship you for who you are. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.